Welcome to Theo Trade. This is Don Kaufman. It is December 23rd, 2017. First and foremost, happy holidays to all. Next, let's get into the market here. A little bit of a uh, weekend review, and then we're going to look at what we can expect here into the last trading week of the year. Uh, also make a quick announcement on that front here at Theo Trade. We will be broadcasting our regular scheduled program all throughout the course of the week. Even if markets are light, listen, a lot of you guys, you know, you're home for the holidays, maybe taking a couple of days off over here, but we will be broadcasting December 26th through the 29th, all four days of this trading week into the end of the year. With that, let's get to it. So the S&Ps have a rather quiet week on their hands. Ultimately, Monday, we hit all-time highs, a slight fade throughout the course of the week. But the S&Ps are kind of in contrast to a few of the other major markets. Let's switch from the S&Ps and cruise over to the Qs, specifically the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ, okay, although it did hit all-time highs on Monday, faded again throughout the course of the week, but ultimately closed the week down ever so slightly. And again, if you're not used to looking at the, uh, at the screen the way I've got it kind of uh, presented over here, what these lines represent are expected move. It's the option market's depiction of risk throughout the course of a week. And it's it's always a one week move. So it's a Monday to a Friday. It's what the option markets, again, kind of depict that risk to be and what the range to ultimately be. And if you take a look at this right here, that is, um, this candle is always going to be a Friday. This candle right here would be the following Friday. So, you know, week over week, we see a slight decline, again, a slight decline inside of the NASDAQ. Now, again, kind of in contrast to that, let's cruise over to the Russell and apply our automated expected moves over here. And what do we see specifically in the Russell for this past week is the Russell takes off to the upside and literally skirts the edge of the expected move throughout the course of the week. For those of you that do, again, kind of tune in day in and day out or week in and week out, we talk extensively about the expected moves because there's incredibly high probabilities now of us adhering to these expected moves. Now, I'm going to come back a little bit later to both the, the Russell and and specifically the financials in regards to their expected moves. So again, the S&Ps do very, very little. The NASDAQ, okay, fades a little bit on the week, right? And the Russell is pretty much the hottest indice ultimately going. So what really changed this week? And, you know, overall, if you're looking at the major indices and you're like, ah, oh, right, not that much change this week, However, there is a massive change this week, and I want to bring that to everyone's attention. If you've missed what has gone on in the bond market, well, ultimately, you've kind of missed the entire marketplace this week, and this is what I wanted to bring up. So in order to display the bonds, in this case, I'm going to use the TLT. Now, many of you might know, I trade a lot of ZB, which is it's a 30-year U.S. Treasury bond futures. The ZB is not necessarily the, you know, the most retail friendly product and the, uh, the TLT happens to be the ETF. Okay. It's somewhere between the 10 year and the 30 year bond. It's actually a 20 year bond ETF. Nevertheless, TLT would be perfect to kind of exemplify this move. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you kind of the, the average week, if you will, inside of bonds. Okay. If you look at bonds on any given week, and here is TLT, right? And this is this coming week. And, you know, there's only four trading days. So, of course, Christmas is going to fall on a Monday. Here we are in Christmas Eve, Eve, recording this. But Christmas is going to fall on a Monday. So we've got Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday as trading sessions. Um, the bonds, okay, in this coming week are showing about a $1.31 expected move, meaning that the option markets expect them to move about a buck 31. If you look back in time, and again, I'm going to close up this left side bar for just a moment. And I want to show you what I've done is I've just backed up the date a little bit here. You know, why did I pick December 16th? Well, December 16th, it's exactly a week ago. So I wanted to show you, okay, what the risk, you know, kind of prototypically looks like. And it's about 
again, about a dollar twenty-five was last week's expected move. But look at the actual move of the marketplace. And to also kind of delineate this a little bit more effectively, I'm applying auto expected moves. And I'm just going to show you ultimately where the week began. So uh, again, right in here is where the week kind of started out. And in uh, five trading sessions, the bonds absolutely imploded, okay, below their expected move. Specifically, the move that we had last week was really, it was about $3, okay, in 82 cents. Now, why Why is that interesting? So the move to the downside, and again, it rebounded a little bit, but the move to the downside was $3.82. The first thing that is critical about that is if you do some quick math over here, that's almost exactly three times what was expected. It's what we call a three sigma move, which is, well, an extraordinarily rare occurrence. You know, if you look at a distribution curve, and again, I'll spend a minute on this because it is unusual. And I'm gonna show you what's even more unusual. If you look at a distribution curve and I'll draw some little hash marks over here and you kind of say to yourself, well, most things happen in here, which is 68%, that's one deviation. Then you get, you know, two sigma out here, that's two sigmas, okay? That would account for 95% of all occurrences, then all the way out here, okay, occurs for about, you know, what? That accounts for about 99% of all occurrences. So that's how wild of a move we had. It was about a three sigma move in the bonds. Now, why am I saying this? Like, well, all right, you know, whatever, Don, big move in the bonds, you know, news flash is big move in the bonds. There is news in here, and I'll show you why it's so imperative to understand this. So the bonds, okay, break down hard and fast, and what, what you know, is related to the bonds? Well, interest rates. So I'll bring up, for instance, TNX. Now, the TNX happens to be the 10-year Treasury index, okay? Interest rates clearly shot up, okay? Just shy of 2.5%. Now, the reason I'm pointing this out is that the, the yield, the interest rate that goes skyrocketing in the last couple of weeks, you would believe would have this drastic impact specifically on the XLF. As I said, you know, I'll be bringing up the XLF here in a moment. And this is the one of the things that, you know, I'm just kind of shocked about. So I'm going to apply, you know, automated expected moves here. And when I say automated expected moves, this is a script. The thing that, that really stood out this week is, yes, to a degree, all right, we had the financials rally, but the financials held the line, okay? And that line that I just drew on the screen, that's the expected move, and literally, the financials just skirted the edge of the expected move, okay? Along with it, okay, you had the Russell skirting the edge of the expected move. Why? Because the Russell is heavily influenced by financials. In fact, if you look at financials, they really have the largest impact, okay, in terms of like a sector, they have the largest impact on the Russell as a product over here. Uh, again, why this really, really stands out to me, okay, and why I'm spending so much time on it is this is something we're going to be watching very carefully into the end of the year. Are the financials not keeping up with interest rates kind of exploding to the upside or, or have interest rates taken off so quickly that that could actually be not beneficial to the financials out there? So why do I care so much about the financials in the first place? I mean, what? That's a relative question over there, right? Why should we care about, you know, the financials over here? I'll tell you why you should really look at the financials, okay? Because the financials drive a lot of what the spiders do. So here I've brought up the spiders. I'm going to cruise over to study. So I'm going to go to add study, compare with, custom symbol, type in XLF, hit enter. So I'm just comparing, all right, the financials to the spiders. Then I'm going to actually change from style. We're going to cruise down over here and make it from a candle chart to a line. So comparing line to line. But do you see anything, okay, that stands out to you? You should, okay, because for the most part, they're moving in relative tandem. And the XLF has been one of the primary and driving forces behind the spiders. Now, no doubt technology has a lot to do with it, but you better pay attention to what's going on in the bonds right now. So the bonds are selling off huge, and you would think that that would just burst the financials to the upside. Well, the financials did trade to the upside, 
But the financials didn't have some like three sigma move. They didn't have, you know, a three standard deviation move to the upside like the bonds did ultimately to the downside. Again, the reason I'm pointing out, you know, the spiders versus is again, if you take a look at this on a percentage basis, so I'm going to show you price percentage and, you know, you're looking at pretty much an entire what year. In fact, specifically, I'm going to drop this, okay, time frame exactly to, uh, to one year. So we're all comfortable with uh, what a year kind of returns are over here. And if you kind of zoom into it, both the S&Ps, okay, and specifically this is the spiders, both the S&Ps and the financials are up just around 18%, closer to 19% on a year-to-date basis. And you can see the relationship and how heavy the relationship has been even over the last three years, okay? The financials are a primary driver of the entire S&P 500. And again, what we're seeing right now, and now I'm actually going to take you back to the ZB, what we're seeing right now inside of the ZB is a little bit scary. The question, and I'm going to come in here now and we're going to look at the ZB for a second. The question is, and this, this is the only question to really ask, all right, okay, is there going to be follow through to the sell side activity inside of the bonds, okay? in the last week of the year or after the first of the year? It's the only question, because, and I'm gonna tell you, like, I know that, that people are gonna look for this, like, well, look at a Fibonacci, look at oversold, look at this, okay? Nothing is going to give you an answer other than the order flow itself. And I know that that sometimes is, is difficult for people to get, okay? But there's nothing out here to depict what these bond markets are ultimately about to, to do, okay? This, right now, you just gotta be aware. This is the biggest marketplace pretty much out there. The treasuries are unbelievable in, si in terms of size. You know, people think about, you know, stocks like Google, you know, they're infatuated these days with like Bitcoin. And then you look at a contract here, you know, like a, just a ZB, okay? And you look at a ZB and it's trading like, you know, the 150 handle and you realize one contract, one is 150 grand. Trade two or three of these things, it's like trading a house. Okay, and they've been doing monumental volume. Hold on, in a week that's supposed to be relatively quiet. Everybody told me, oh, I don't even don't even worry about the markets this week. Nothing's going on. Oh yeah, nothing's going on except you know three hundred and eighteen thousand contracts of the ZB traded earlier in the week. If that's nothing going on, I mean, come on, it's some of the heaviest volume we've actually seen in the year just happened this past week, and again. Big break to the downside. The whole question, okay, and I'm telling you, there is not a definitive answer. If there's follow through to this, is is that okay? And when I say there's follow through to this, if these bonds sell off big, right, and come under, I would say right around that like 150 demarcation point. So if they come under the 150 and they continue to kind of sell off over there, that is going to take interest rates, the yield associated with this, and it's going to spike the yield. Okay, now. Is there a trade in there? Yeah, you better believe it, okay? And this is one of the things I, I wanna look at. Um, and the trade for me, now there's a number of trades. You could go after the financials, okay? But the financials, sometimes the financials react really, really well to a rising interest rate environment. But they didn't react very well this past week, okay? I think the easiest trade though to go after in here would be something like XHB. At what point, okay? Are the home builders gonna really take pain if these interest rates start to explode higher? Now, I'm gonna show you, this is kind of the entire history, if you will, going all the way back into 2000. Again, you're looking at 2006, where my mouse happens to be on, all the way back here. We are just off the all time high, okay, going all the way back to the real estate boom. Now, that's something not enough people are looking at right now. The XHB, which is, again, it's the Home Builders ETF, is just off the all-time high, okay? We're going to watch this, okay, over the next week, and this is not just some, some short duration position. Now, again, I kind of believe that there's still a little bit more upside inside of the XHB. However, I'm going to be hunting for a longer duration short position inside 
of the XH, uh, XHB, kind of stalking positions. That's what I do. I don't come in here and like, that's it. You know, this is not necessarily just going to be a short duration trade. This is something where, you know, and, and I don't know if you guys have heard this term, but it's for me, it's an investment to the downside. You may ask like, how are you going to get short something? Come on, how are you going to get short something like the XHB? Well, first of all, it's easy to borrow, so you could just short the underlying. But some of you, you know, you might be doing this inside of an IRA. I totally get it. And if you are doing it inside of an IRA, okay, you have to start looking at options that are a little bit deeper in the money that you create what we call synthetic shorts. And you might look at something like an 85 or a 90 delta. Now, markets are closed. The bid offer spreads are a little widened here right now. Nevertheless, using like a 90 delta put is, for the most part, giving you a synthetic relationship, okay, with short stock. And what that ultimately means is by buying these puts, you're getting 90 delta, which is effectively over the next 55 days, and I'll kind of give you the, uh, the brief context of this, over the next 55 days, you're going to get about 90% of the movement in this option, okay, for every dollar move of the stock. So if the stock moves a buck, you get about 90 cents bang for your buck. However, let's say this option trades at a price, okay, price point of about $2.90. But if you're able to buy this thing for $2.90, that's the max risk is $2.90. You don't have to put yourself on the line, even if this thing does explode back to the upside. And this is all kind of predicated on what we're going to see inside of the bonds. Again, a reminder to everybody, well, first of all, happy holidays. Number two, we're going to be broadcasting all throughout the course of this week, the 26th through the 29th. And we invite you to join us in the Theo Trade chat room. Again, happy holidays. Have a great weekend and a uh, great holiday season. Bye-bye.